And uh, welcome to last class for the semester. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a uh, it's sad but a relief too, I guess, uh, for for all of us probably. It's been, it's been I'm sure busy semester, but a fun one, right? Um, okay, so uh, review Sunday evening. Uh, we, uh, question and answer only. Don't have anything prepared for that. Um, final exam, open notes, open everything. You're going to get a new paper that you've never seen that relates to some of the research that we have talked about in the, the class, and you'll need to compare that. Two practice exams up on Blackboard. Each of them has a different research article that was given out with that exam um, and questions that are there to address. Um, so today we're going to finish up our discussion of neuroprosthetic devices um, and this sort of uh, simplified two-dimensional situation where we're talking about how to move a cursor on a screen um, as a way to understand some of the mathematical um, uh, methods used in moving three-dimensional or multi-dimensional when you start considering individual fingers, neuroprosthetic devices. Um, and in doing that, also considering um, uh, some of the challenges associated with converting firing rates for neurons in uh, motor cortex into signals that a computer can use to move a cursor around or move a robotic arm around. Um, and so this is the, the two neurons that we've been talking about for the last, two and a half, uh, last class and a half or so, um, uh, neuron A and neuron B. They both have a baseline firing rate of 10 spikes per second, which means that when you're doing nothing at all, um, uh, when the animal is just sitting there resting, those neurons are ticking away 10 times a second. And for certain movements, the, an the, the neurons increase their firing. Um, higher order systems will be exciting those neurons, and then the increase in firing of those neurons tends to make the arm move in a particular direction. Um, for other kinds of movements that are perpendicular to that direction of movement, um, those neurons neither get excited nor inhibit, or maybe they get an equal balance of excitation and inhibition. Um, and, in either, and in either case, their firing rate stays constant, and so the arm neither tends to move toward nor away their preferred for, from, from their preferred direction. Um, and then if the animal wants to move in a different direction, um, opposite that, then um, those, those neurons will be inhibited, they will slow down, and that, together with excitation of neurons that probably prefer the other direction, will tend to move the arm in the opposite direction. So that's sort of our, our setup. Um, last time we had this assignment to sort of think about why we missed the target, what are some of the challenges. So we've been talking about um, uh, what's, uh, what's known as... Um, a, um, a population vector average um, algorithm um, or PVA algorithm um, and, um, and that is just to take whatever set of neurons that we have and um, at any instant in time, each neuron's firing properties will be represented by a single vector, and then we're going to average those vectors together. And to average vectors, you need to first add them, and adding a vector is a process that involves, um, if, if, the ve if we're doing this in two dimensions, we need to keep track of directionality while we're adding our vectors. So we had, um, uh, uh, um, uh, I don't have lost track of where we were before, so we'll just start with, um, uh, so example 11 is that um, our firing rate on neuron A um, is uh, 20 hertz. And our firing rate on, um, on neuron B is also 20 hertz. Um, and in this case, the population vector average algorithm works beautifully for us. Um, we get for neuron A, its preferred direction is right, so its vectors are always going to be right. So neuron A, and, and the length of the vector is just firing rate right now, 20 hertz minus baseline firing rate of 10 hertz, so we get a vector pointing right of length 10. Neuron B, its vectors always point down, we get a vector pointing down with length 10. Um, we add those together, head to tail, 
and our resulting vector has a 45 degree angle um, going right to the direction that the monkey wanted this arm or cursor or whatever to go to. <clears throat> um, and so everything works out really nicely. Population vector algorithm is working great in this situation. <clears throat> um, we had another example, which I'll, today I'll just call example number 12, um, and in, or some version of this where the firing rate of, uh, of uh, cell A maybe is down at 5 hertz. So the vector points right with length of negative 5 because 5 hertz minus the baseline of 10 gets us negative 5. So we go right negative 5, which looks like that. Um, firing rate for neuron B um, is uh, also 5 hertz. So we go down with negative 5, which looks like that. And then we add these together and we get... Um, a sum vector that still points in the correct direction, but is smaller. Um, when, so averaging, you add everything up, and in adding vectors, you need to keep track of their direction. And then you divide by the number of inputs. In this case, our number is 2. Um, if you have 100, you're dividing by 100. Um, <coughs> And, uh, and since that number is, there's no direction associated with that number we're dividing by, it's just a, what's called a scalar number, um, then that doesn't change the direction of our vector when we, when we go from an, a summation to an average. Um, but uh, because these neurons encode sort of combination, as we, as we talked about a little bit, and as you work through in one of the, one of the assigned problems, um, the, um, these neurons encode sort of a mix of speed and direction, uh, speed, yeah, speed and direction with their firing. Um, this, uh, this situation here in example 12 is going to get going in the right direction, but it's going to be sluggish. It's not going to go there maybe as fast as the monkey would want it to go. So before I go on to the next example where things get even more problematic, um, what questions do people have about this? Any of the stuff so far reviewing here? All right, so um, our... Next example that we had last time, or there's some version of this that we had last time, firing rate of neuron A, maybe again 5 hertz, um, firing rate of neuron B, um, now maybe is 20 hertz. Um, so again, neuron A now, rightward direction, ne negative 5 length, that looks like this. Neuron B, downward uh, uh, direction, plus 10 length, so like this. And then we add those together, and we get something that goes way down, and then a little bit to the right. And then, um, so our monkey wanted, um, did we get that? Oh, way down a little bit to the left. So our monkey wanted to get to this point, but in reality, the cursor goes off like this and misses the target. Um, and so this is not good if we're extending this to uh, robotic arms. That means punching somebody in the stomach when you mean to shake their hand or whatever. So um, this is a problematic situation that we've got here. And so last time we brainstormed a little bit in this sort of vector adding situation of what we can change to avoid the problems with things like example number 12 here, and especially with example number 13 here. Um, okay, so any questions about the problems going on? We talked a little bit about the, the problem is, in, in a sense, I mean, one way to think about the problem is that, um, uh, actually here, maybe I'll sort of write this over here. Um, one, one, ver one potential way to think about, or one, one aspect of, the problem and the challenge that we're facing is that neurons are inherently nonlinear. Um, neurons do have a maximum firing rate because they have a refractory period. We talked about that a little bit in unit number one. Um, but the maximum firing rate for a neuron might be 100 spikes per second, 50 spikes per second. 
And so if a neuron is baseline at 10 spikes per second, then that's 40 hertz worth of space that it can explore in terms of increasing its firing rate. There's a lot of capacity to encode movements in the preferred direction with increased firing rate. Um, on, on the other hand, um, if it's going to slow down, there's um, a minimum speed as well, and that minimum speed is zero. It can't fire less than not at all. Um, there's no such thing as negative firing rates. Um, and so what that means is that the neuron has, um, uh, sort of plot again, its firing rate. Um, so... Um, and then maybe this is our baseline. Um, this is our rest situation right here. Um, when, the neuro, when the monkey wants to move in the preferred direction, there's a lot of space to explore. When it wants to move in the non-preferred direction, um, we, can, we, we have a, a different slope. This population vector average algorithm assumes that the neuron is linear. So our PVA algorithm is assuming linear neurons. Um, that's because the way we calculate in this the length of a vector is just the firing rate at some time minus the firing rate of the baseline. And if the neurons are moving in a, in a consistent line, a consistent linear scaling of their firing rate relative to the baseline, that works. Um, but if movements in one direction have a different um, function, it's different slope, than movements in the other direction, um, then that means that, the, that we're going to get these sorts of errors cropping up. Does that make sense? What questions do people have about that? Just the sort of problem with the ve vector algorithm here. OK, so, um, so last time. We had three solutions that people came up with um, for this. Um, so uh, solution number one um, was more neurons. Or one of the solutions that people came up with is more neurons. Um, so if we, sure, if we have two neurons, maybe um, the nonlinearities in these two neurons become really important and mess up the way that we're able to do our experiment. Um, if we have 100 neurons, then we should expect much more likely to have some neurons that prefer rightward movement, some neurons that prefer leftward movement, some neurons that prefer up, some neurons that prefer down. And so the, um, the preferred and the number of neurons that sort of represent preferred versus non-preferred directions in all of the different directions um, will more or less average out. And so we will have um, uh, collectively much better accuracy. Um, take along with that the fact that neurons are not perfect encoders of information. Um, from one trial to the next, the number of spikes, the timing of those spikes varies a little bit. Um, it, it just makes sense that um, the, the more neurons we have to work with, the better off we're going to be. Um, uh, sort of hoping that where our sort of hope here is that um, our, um, our sampling of various preferred directions <coughs> will sort of average out. Um, and that's perfectly legitimate solution to this problem. Um, if We've already done brain surgery on this monkey or on a person and implanted electrodes in. Um, then doing a second surgery um, may be technically challenging to ethically impossible. Um, 
to do for either monkeys or humans. Um, a, lot, a lot of times doing multiple surgeries on even a rat is something that, that you have to very um, clearly justify why you need to do this on an animal, um, let alone a monkey and, and, and certainly let alone a person. <coughs> um, and so, well, in, in addition to that, while it's true that more neurons usually works, um, works it cer certainly works better than two. Um, what people find is that actually um, motor cortex, while there's not necessarily a clear map within motor cortex, the size of these probes that collect, that have a hundred little electrodes on them are smaller than a dime. Um, and they're collecting from a very small zone in motor cortex where they're maybe getting a few hundred neurons. Um, and that zone, sometimes you find that a larger fraction of your neurons prefer rightward movements over leftward movements, for example. Um, and that's just by the sort of random plopping down or nearly random plopping down of where you put your little probe that's got a hundred electrodes on it in the brain of this animal or human um, and, um, and doing a second surgery to collect more neurons may just not be an option. Um, so in principle, it's a good idea to solve this problem, but in practice, um, w whether we've got two neurons or a hundred neurons, in fact, even in cases of a hundred neurons, um, these sorts of problems do crop up, even more so when we're doing multidimensional, um, uh, three-dimensional, five-dimensional, ten-dimensional, when we're trying to encode many different kinds of movements, maybe now all of a sudden there are only a handful of, move, of neurons that encode movement of the pointer finger and a handful of neurons that encode movement of the uh, middle finger and so on and so forth. Um, and so um, more neurons is not necessarily always an option. Does that make sense? Questions about any of that so far? Okay, um, so um, so solution. I think this is maybe the third one, but so, uh, but uh, solution number two is to change our algorithm. So we noticed here that. Um, there, like I said before, there's sort of different space, different, uh, different amounts, uh, di different capacity to change firing rate in terms of increasing as compared to decreasing firing rate. Um, so another way to say that is that for every one hertz that the firing rate goes down, that means about as much as a two hertz increase in firing rate. Um, so looking back at our plots here, for straight in this neuron B, for straight downward movement, we get 20 hertz change for straight down, but only a 10 hertz change for straight up. For diagonally down, we get a 10 hertz change. For diagonally up, we get a 5 hertz change. Um, and maybe for if the monkey wants to go here, maybe that would be 9 hertz. And wanting to go the same angle off over this way might be 12 hertz, for example. Um, ultimately, we don't just want to be able to go in, in eight different directions. We want to be able to go in any direction in two dimensional space or eventually any direction in three or five or whatever dimensional space. Um, and, so, and so we notice in, um, in our, in our uh, data um, that these neurons are nonlinear. And so we change our algorithm to correct for this nonlinearity. Um, and in changing our neuron to correct for this nonlinearity, we now switch from, instead of a population vector average algorithm, um, we call this an optimized linear estimator, or optimized linear estimation algorithm.
Um, so we're, um, it's linear in the sense that we're still adding together the vectors of each of the neurons. It's just that the, the, the correction for the internal nonlinearity that we're doing, our correction, is that we just say any negative vector gets multiplied by 2. Any? Yeah, sure. What's up? How would multiplying it by 2 affect the nonlinearity? Um, yeah, so, so, I mean, so essentially what we're saying is back here in example 1 our vector is plus 10, leave that alone. Example 2, our vector is plus 10, leave that alone. Here our vector is minus 5, we double the size of that, and so we make it into a minus 10 vector. Here our vector is minus 5, we double that, make it into a minus 10 vector. Here our vector is minus 5, we double that. Here our vector is plus, leave it alone. So, um, yeah, there's another hand up here. So. Um, they're, all neurons have inherent nonlinearities in them, so, um, yeah. Um, the, 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 well, should, should have been that. There are actually some neurons that are surprisingly linear in some parts of the brain, um, and the ways in which different neurons are nonlinear is, is not necessarily as simple as this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know. I mean, actually, so I'm simple. You have to, to figure out the extent to which it's nonlinear, and that depends on each individual neuron. Higher baseline firing rates are going to have less nonlinearities than neurons with lower baseline firing rates. It, yeah. Yeah. So do both of these solutions pretty much just change the weight of information that the neurons bring to this situation? Um... Well, they, they're, it's a conditional change in the weight. Well, so the first one, in a sense, changes the weight of all of the neurons because we're, we're averaging across many more. In the second one, we're conditionally changing the weight um, to pay more attention to those neurons that are decreasing than increasing. But yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Uh, part, Part of the, um, I guess, let's, let's maybe, let's take maybe two minutes, um, write it down, a piece of paper and everything um, with your names on it, but, um, but just sort of convince yourself that if we do this, we're gonna, what, what is the answer we're going to get for number 11, what's the answer we're going to get for number 12, and what's the answer we're going to get for number 13? Um, and, then, and then we'll come back and, and, and like, how do you get to the answer? Okay, so, uh, so since we kind of want to get to the third solution, I'll just sort of quickly recap this. Um, in Question 11, example 11, nothing changes because both our vectors were positive, so we don't multiply anything. And that's fine, that works because we got to our target, we got there quickly, it's all good. Um, in question 12, we went the right direction, but we kind of were a little sluggish getting there. Um, and, uh, and since what's going to happen, since both the vectors are negative, they're both multiplied by 2, we're going to go faster, the cursor is going to move faster to get there, the computer is going to uh, um, uh, decode that as a bigger change because it's multiplying them by 2, get us going faster. Um, in number 13, where we missed the target, um, now we're going to hit it because our um, rightward vector of minus 5 gets to doubled into a rightward vector of minus 10, which means now we're going again off at a 45 degree angle, and we're going to hit our target over here. Does that make sense? Any questions about that issue, that, that solution? Okay, so, um, so solution um, three, which um, sort of... <coughs> come at this a little bit differently than the way it was proposed. Um, solution three, let's just sort of imagine we're going to wave a magic wand and change our neurons firing properties. So we're going to keep their, their same preferred direction. That's like a permanent fact about them. Um, but we're going to otherwise somehow reprogram the neurons 
Um, although we'll keep their preferred direction. That's a permanent fact about them. That's um, that's uh, our sort of all. That's why our vectors always point the same way for every neuron, um, and so we'll change them in sort of this way. So neuron A. Let's change it so its baseline becomes 20 hertz. Just get neuron A firing faster at baseline, um, and so for up and down movement. Neuron A doesn't change anything, doesn't change its firing, still going 20 hertz. For rightward movement, that's still neuron A's preferred direction. Goes up by 20 hertz. Uh, over here, 30 hertz. 30 hertz. Um, but now we have a lot more space to encode leftward movement. And now we can make this 10 hertz, 0, 10 hertz. Um, Neuron B, basically the same thing. Actually, let's do this. Let's, so, uh, well, no, that's all right. I'll write it out. So neuron A, it's baseline. Neuron B, baseline is 20 hertz. Um, over here, 40, 30, 30, 20, 20, 10, 0, 10. So if our magic wand works and we, re and we, we revise our neurons so that they have these new firing properties associated with them, now for all three examples, work through what are we going to get, what's going to happen, um, and what sort of direction and speed is the cursor going to be going in uh, example 11, 12, and 13 up there. So let's take four or five minutes to work through that um, in this situation here. Oh, um, I guess I should add, so what is the firing rate? So example A, firing rate of neuron A is 30. Um, And notice the baseline change, so the way we calculate the length, you need to take into account the new baseline. Yeah, it's like make a vector for A, vector for B, add them together, yeah. Uh, the lengths end up all being equal, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, so as you're finishing up, um, with uh, example 11, our firing rate for neuron A at this point in time is 30 hertz, the baseline's 20 hertz, what direction do neuron A vectors point? Uh, neuron A vectors point... No, uh, no, no. That's, uh, that's, yeah, so our final vector is going to point down and to the right. But neuron A vectors always point straight to the right. And it's got a length of 30 minus 20, so a length of 10. Um, neuron B, what direction do its vectors point? Straight down. Um, 30 minus 20 is 10, length of 10. If we add those together, then we're going to get a nice 45 degree angle, um, good speed of movement right to where the monkey wants to go based on the way the problem's set up. Over here, neuron A vectors again always point right. What's the length of our rightward pointing vector? We want to be pedantic about it. Negative 10, so we draw that like this. Right, negative 10. This one, same thing. Down, negative 10. And so we add those together and we get nice 45 degree vector going right to where the monkey wants to go based on the way the problem's set up. Um, here, this case, um, again, a rightward vector of negative 10, just like we worked out in this example. Um, a 
an upward vector, sorry, downward vector of positive 10. So like this, and then we add those together. And our resulting vector is a nice 45 degree angle pointing right to our target. So we solve the problem. Um, the question then, I guess actually before I ask my question, what, what question is, yes? Yeah. If you're subtracting the baseline, aren't you getting a negative by right? You're getting, um, so you're getting a negative, so um, you're getting a negative length. So the firing rate is something that you measure as an average when the animal's sitting still, that's our baseline, and then at any moment in time that number changes as the neuron speeds up and slows down, and that's never, pro never negative. But when we do the difference between two firing rates, if the one we're subtracting is larger than the one that we start with, then the, then the, then, I mean, I guess we would, you know, the units would be hertz, but then we're actually, since we're going to convert this into speed, we would actually say our length is probably, uh, if we want to be sort of like super, our, the length of our vector is going to be maybe one centimeter times this. So we end up with units of centimeters per second. And so, yeah, um, if we want to really get technical about it. But yeah, we're sort of more concerned with the direction. Did, did that answer your question though? Kind of? There's a unit conversion that I'm skipping over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then the question is, how do we get our monkey to do this? Um, and so just kind of to back up and look at our earlier solutions. So surgeon one, if it's a human, is a real pain in the butt for the patient. It's a pain in the butt for a whole lot of surgeons. Um, it's um, an ethically questionable at best uh, idea. Um, uh, would solve the problem. Solution two, um, if we have a whole lot of neurons that we're doing this with, then that means figuring out the specific nonlinearities associated with each neuron um, and how to correct them algorithmically, which means it's a pain in the butt for our computer programmers, doable, um, uh, and certainly if people do this. Um, and actually a lot of people prefer the, um, these optimized linear estimators over population vector algorithms because you can show that for, um, it, for an untrained animal, this is going to work better. Um, but another thing that we can do is not, not you know, open the animal's brain up, but just sort of piss the animal off for a little while. And that's our magic wand that's going to create this solution for us. And so what we do is we hook the animal up to a computer that assumes that its neurons are all linear, and then let the animal miss the target for a while. And the animal gets annoyed because it's not getting its juice rewards because it's missing the target. But in getting annoyed, it's, all, it's getting close, right? You know, sometimes it's getting the target. There's motivation there. Feels like it should be able to solve this problem. Um, but a lot of the times it's missing. And its brain sort of is tracking those times that it's missing. And somehow, through mechanisms that are completely not understood, but are actually major areas of investigation in a few labs um, here at Carnegie Mellon and in other places in Pittsburgh and around the world, um, the brain rewires itself. Well, we, one thing we do know is baseline firing rates go up and the neurons do become more linear in the way they process information. Um, so the neurons change their parameters to fit what are simple-minded and mostly wrong computer program expected them to do. So now they are behaving like our computer expected them to because that's the way the animal can successfully get the thing to move around. Does that make sense? Sort of? Yeah, sure. Does that have any, like, other consequences? You know, it's interesting. Like, um, what, what you can do is, um, if, if it's, uh, the animal will, um, very much like the owls, um, can quickly move between one mode of coding when it's moving its arm and a different mode of coding when it's moving the cursor. And sometimes the animals, um, sometimes you have, like, the animals have to do things where they reach or control a cursor by, by their brain. And every once in a while when the animals get really good at brain control and you, inter and you introduce a time when they have to reach with their arm, they sort of resist that. They're like, no, 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 I can do this all with my mind. Why make me move my darn arm for this thing? Um, but the, the, neuro, the neural coding actually flip-flops back and forth relatively quickly and learns two modes of operating, very much like the owls that we talked about. Yeah, so, um, so 
uh, if this is going to work. If I'm lucky, maybe not. We'll see. Um, there we go. So here the, the blue is the target that the animal's trying to get to. Um, and the green is the, is the thing that it's controlling. And sometimes the animal gets right there. Sometimes it misses the target. Um, other times it's sort of slow to get there but eventually reaches it um, or misses and kind of like tries to get back and can't quite. The animal only has a second to get to the target in this. Um, and so the animal in this training process is, is making some mistakes. Um, let's see, can I get this to move forward? Um, and then after training, um, the animals get really good at this. Um, they still make a few mistakes, but they can get pretty quick at, and, and here in this one, the animal's almost every time getting to that target. Um, sometimes it gets there, it can't quite hold it there, um, and so uh, there's a little bit, um, but yeah, so, so after training, the animals get, um, get much, much better at what they're doing. Um, and this video that I showed before is a video where the animal, um, it took a lot of training, but the animal got there and it uses a population vector averaging algorithm um, for the animal to be able to reach to these things. Um, and so it's... Um, like with any neuroprosthetic, when we talked about the ones where you have to remap that shoulder, that contracting your deltoid is how you actually bend the elbow. Um, these, these none of these prosthetic devices, even the optimized linear estimator prosthetic devices, aren't completely plug and go. Um, there's a learning process that goes on. Um, but um, because there's this learning process that goes on, we can take advantage of it and make a really simple computer program that's easy to code up and then let the animal do all the hard work of converting its neural firing patterns to match what our computer program was expecting it to have. Questions about that? So, um, and so one of the things I should mention actually, the, the, the assignment talks about closed loop control. What, closed, what open loop control means is we record what the animal's brain does, move a cursor, but we don't show the animal, we don't give it this visual feedback and show the animal where the cursor actually goes. In a closed loop system, the loop gets, we record, and then decode and move a cursor, and then in a closed loop, the animal sees what happens and then can learn to correct. And so the, the closing of the loop happens at whether or not the animal sees how our computer decoded its, its brain activity, and if it does see, then the animal is able to correct what goes on. Does that make sense? There's a question about closed loop, and so that's sort of what it means is giving the animal feedback so it can correct the errors that are happening because our computer program was too simple for the animal's brain initially. It's too poor, not perfectly designed for it. Um, a couple other sort of quick comments about that. So in open loop situations where the animal can't see what's going on, um, even when we get um, 50, 100, 150 neurons, um, we're do, we do fewer errors than if we have five neurons to go off of. <coughs> um, but um, with this population vector algorithm, um, population vector average algorithm, more neurons does improve the situation for us. Um, but um, the real sort of, mat and actually, um, for optimized linear estimators, um, they do um, pretty well whether or not the animals got visual feedback because they're, we've already readjusted everything to, to best match our animal as best we can. Um, but if we, if we do this closed loop situation where the animal can see its mistakes, then the population vector algorithm works just as well as, um, as our sort of uh, more intelligently programmed system. Okay, so what questions do people have about that? Um, this is actually, oh, it was there, okay. Um, this is um, uh, animals that are trained on population vector algorithms. If you quickly switch them over to optimal linear estimators, they make a lot of mistakes. They can then readjust with a little bit of practice and then quickly switch back and forth. Um, animals that are first trained on optimal linear estimators make errors with population vector <laughs> algorithms, um, but then um, could also learn that second mapping. Um, and so this is just sort of showing that uh, it, you know the animal learns to work with the computer program you provide as the decoder. <coughs> yeah, sure. So can we relate this um, switching back and forth with kind of like what we saw with the owls? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think this is very similar to what we saw with the barn owls, where um, they um, they learn two modes. In this case, it's two modes of motor control. Um, they actually learn multiple modes because they also learn a separate mode. Um, and one of the other things that, that happens as well is the animals sometimes move their arms, but the really well-trained animals, their arms don't move anymore. Um, but then they can move their arms when we make them. So, um, so that tells us that there's something else that's even further going on that we don't fully understand, where the animal can sort of shut off its motor cortex's connection to the rest of the body when it's doing brain control problems, and then when it's doing hand control problems, then it can turn that connection back on. Um, and so there's many, the brain sort of learns these multiple modes of operating. Again, very, yeah, very much like the owls that we discussed before. Good question for like the final exam. We're sort of looking for links between ideas and units and so on. So yeah. Other questions about any of that? Okay, so um, so I just want to kind of even though I don't have a summary for the review session since we have five minutes now. Um, summarize a little bit about some of the stuff that we've talked about. There are a lot of different ideas that we've kind of worked through in this class. Um, uh, in Unit 1 especially, we talked about how um, electrochemical signals in neurons communicate information. Um, and then this actually relates back to some of the stuff that came up um, in Unit 4 when we were talking about um, sensory systems and the way that action potentials and synaptic communication represent information um, and that neurons um, represent uh, um, Re represent, convert the external world into action potentials, and then um, extract and transmit that information about the world um, in through the, uh, into the brain, and ultimately through the brain to, to result in um, um, uh, mo motor outputs, for example. Um, We've also talked, there have been a few cases in this class where we've sort of seen that neurons are imperfect processors um, in a lot of different ways. Um, one example is that um, neurons in the sensory system seem to encode very precisely incoming information with their timing of their action potentials, um, but the brain is actually seems to be unable to take advantage of a lot of that beautiful information present in the timings of action potentials. Um, and so it's almost like um, uh, we're reading the animal's uh, sensory inputs or we're reading the animal's mind better than its own brain can read its sensory inputs when we record the timing of every single action potential. Um, and, and so um, the br brains work, but, they, uh, but the, not necessarily as ideally as we might hope that they would. Um, in this last example, as well as in unit Three, we talked a lot about how experiences alter neural communication um, and, um, and alter the wiring in your cortex, alter the maps that you have, whether it's a visual to auditory correspondence map, a motor, uh, a motor cortex to movement map, um, uh, the, uh, um, the way that uh, the, the, the experiences and interactions that we have with the world change the wiring and, and communication with our brain. Um, this also is actually a big thing in Unit 2 where we talked about declarative memory and the cellular basis with long-term potentiation for how experience alters the way neurons communicate with one another. Um, and then the last thing, which is sort of a little bit more of an abstract idea um, with this, is that um, in, in thinking about science and pursuing science, um, ideas and clever, clever questions are really the foundation of a great scientific inquiry. Um, but what ultimately decides things um, is the data that's out there. Um, and thinking back to Unit 2 especially, um, we saw um, a lot of different ideas and perspectives. Um, but the, the, the new data about silent synapses created a new theoretical framework. And all of a sudden, that new theoretical framework explain not only some of the data about silent synapses, but some of the earlier data that had been used on the opposite side of the, of the um, uh, um, debate. And so, um, and so that made it a much more attractive theoretical framework for explaining a large amount of experimental observations. Um, and I'm not going to read through all of these because they're mostly um, throughout the, the syllabus, um, but uh, just some ideas about kind of uh, you know, why we work through some of these different um, uh, 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 situations with critical analysis and scientific debate and so on is, um, is I hope that even if you forget a lot of the specific facts about the brain that we talked about in this class, that you'll remember sort of these ideas about data analysis and, and, um, and how to um, 
work with data and understand the limitations and, um, and, and the interactions between data and interpretation, which played into the reports as well as other things. So anyway, um, thank you for a nice semester, and I will see you all on the Thursday, Sunday, and then on the final exam on Tuesday.